Uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Darcy Failings. Uh, she's a coalition scientist at uh, Holland Floorfield in Toronto. She's also uh, the chair in uh, developmental pediatrics and the director of the child development program at the uh, University of Toronto and has a lot of expertise and done some fascinating research on uh, innovating and evaluating your rehabilitation treatments for children and youth of CP. So it's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Failings here. Well, I'm really uh, delighted to be here in Montreal today and seeing my friends and colleagues and uh, presenting on a topic that I find really interesting as well. And it's a real treat to uh, speak after uh, Andrew, who's really moved the field forward. Um, Annette and Keiko have asked me to give a practical talk, and so that's uh, what I'll uh, try to share over the next 20 minutes. So uh, how many people are um, practicing clinicians in the audience? I know I won't be able to see. Excellent. And how many are occupational therapists? Okay. Uh, physiotherapists? Other. What are you? The people who are other researchers? How about at the back? There were a few. Great. Excellent. Excellent. All right. And for the practicing clinicians, how many are starting to explore uh, constraint therapy? Okay. How, how many feel really seasoned about it, that they feel like they've got their program and it's working really well? All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's, that's good to hear. So um, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm just going to give a brief overview in terms of what some of the barriers were at Holland Blurview, which is um, a large children's treatment center in Toronto, probably similar to the one here. And then um, I'm going to talk a bit about how we're looking at a practical level of assessing the child which children we're bringing to constraint uh, therapy, and then how we're measuring change, again, at a practical level. And then I'm going to talk with you about where we've landed in terms of the preschool child and where we've landed in terms of the school-aged child, given the body of research and evidence that we have. There we go. Yay. <laughs> All right, so this is a child with cerebral palsy that you're following in your practice. And she has a diagnosis of hemiplegic cerebral palsy. And you can see she's running around. Her gross motor skills are very high. Uh, but she has a lot of difficulty utilizing uh, uh, her, her right hand and uh, grasping. And the parents want to know whether they should spend um, $15,000 and take her down to the States for the intensive camp programs that they offer there, or whether you as the treating occupational therapist can uh, provide some uh, uh, intervention. So this is certainly a question that we were facing at Paul and Blurview, and um, uh, we believe strongly in the public health uh, model of uh, health service delivery, and so we wanted to see if we could rise uh, to the challenge. Um, and these were some of the, the potential barriers that we faced at a practical level when we talked about how we were going to move constraint forward. So at the beginning, people were very resistant, particularly the physicians. They said, you know, what is the evidence for constraint? Is there any evidence that it's actually efficacious? Um, this seems to be a form of torture for the child. I'm not in agreement with moving it forward. And then, uh, thankfully, there uh, was some research that was done, uh, and uh, it looked like uh, there was some evidence for intensive uh, motor practice and constraint therapy. And indeed, at this point in time, I'd say of all the aspects of rehabilitation uh, for pediatrics, it is the area that has the most evidence. Botulinum toxin was in close running up to about five years ago, but I think constraint has surpassed it. 
um, there was a lot of concern about whether constraint is harmful for the child. You know, what are the effects of blocking the uh, function of the good hand over a period of time? Do we really know? How early can we start it? And um, I think that we don't have all the answers to, to that particular question, but certainly that was a potential barrier. The next bullet was a huge barrier. At Holland Blur View, we basically had models of service delivery by therapists that did not relate well to individual intensive therapy for several hours a day for one child. So in an outpatient setting, um, we viewed an active therapy block as um, a one 45-minute session once a week over 12 to 14 weeks. Um, and then monitoring would be you know, once every three months. If we wanted to get intensive, then they would come in as a day patient, and then they could get 45 minutes a day. So none of these were really adding up to what was being reported and what uh, uh, Dr. Gordon has gone over in terms of the amount of intensity that you might need for a uh, constraint. So we, need to get, we needed to get past that barrier as well. There was also questions about which child should we recommend constraint for? Do we know who is going to be responding to constraint? Um, practical questions about how we should actually restrain the dominant hand. And concerns about how to developmentally provide programs for the different age groups. So we ran into a, a quick um, practical problem for the school age child. We initially were using a lot of casting and we realized we couldn't cast during school. So the only time you could cast was over the summer or during the Christmas break to get a long enough period of casting. So um, this is my recollection of how it evolved at Holland Blurview. Um, we had some constraint advocates and I was one of the constraint advocates, and the reason I was an advocate was I was doing some research trying to understand the mechanisms of action. We were seeing really interesting changes on the functional MRI and uh, um, uh, finding it quite interesting. And then the evidence started to mount up, so I really wanted us to jump in. I also didn't like to face parents and say we didn't have an option and that the states was providing something that we didn't have. Um, so we hosted a journal club um, for the whole child development program and invited everybody and we assigned people uh, reading for some of the evidence. And uh, so we went through some of the evidence and then we spent the last hour of the journal club just practically brainstorming about how we could roll out um, a, a program and particularly focusing on the preschool and the school age child. Um, our management supported uh, some OT expert leads to actually take some time away from their clinical practice and develop some um, uh, um, tools for the practicing uh, clinician. And there was a creation of two handbooks, uh, one for the preschooler and one for the school-age child in terms of the types of activities that could be recommended in the constraints. So if you were a new graduate uh, OT, you could go into these handbooks and get some fairly specific ideas of what you could do with the child in a constraint program. And then we had some foundation funding where we piloted a constraint camp um, during the, the summer. And uh, that uh, constraint camp for school-aged children was very successful and we've continued to run it uh, through the summer. So um, that's how we broke through some of the barriers. It'll be interesting to hear later on in the morning how, how people who are providing constraint are starting to break through some of these uh, barriers. So um, the next question, how do you know who might respond to constraint? And I'm sure that um, many of you have your own biases. I know I have my own biases in terms of who I think is going to be a good potential responder, and Dr. Gordon may also have his own biases. But in truth, we actually don't know who is going to be a good responder and who isn't to constraint. 
And I'm always surprised that even children who I think aren't going to respond all seem to make some gains. So I've made it a very simple summary here. I say, you know, does the child have an underlying neurologic condition that's impacting on their hand control? So the, the two most common diagnoses of kids that we provide constrained or intensive um, motor training are children with cerebral palsy and acquired brain injury. And then for constraint, I then ask, is there a significant asymmetry in the hand usage? leading to this potential for developmental disregard. And so my um, child that I think is the best potential responder is the child where in the clinic where you ask them to use their hand and they have some hand control, but outside of the clinic when they're just in their general regular day-to-day -day environment, they're completely ignoring it. And I try to get at that ratio and if I'm hearing that, then I'm really pushing that family to consider trying some constraint. So um, again, at a practical level, what measurements should you be doing pre and post? And these are the ones that we typically do at Holland Bloorview. Um, so the first one is it's very important to set goals and um, in the OT rehab literature we're seeing more and more evidence that if um, uh, therapy is goal based that that helps to drive change. So at a practical level, um, we usually use the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure. I really like it because um, it really gets the child and the parent engaged in the goal setting, and you're setting goals that are meaningful for the child. I prefer it over the goal attainment score scale, which I tend to set individual goals that are more impairment based using the goal attainment scale and more functionally based using the COPM. How many of you guys are familiar with the COPM? And are you, are you using it for goal setting in your practice? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, and then you have to take measurements um, pre and post for sure and uh, often post post like four months six months so that you can see what the longevity of the change is. Um, at a practical level, we often don't do um, detailed testing like the Jepson. If we're doing a research uh, protocol, we will. Um, these are the ones that we're using in the clinic. I love grip strength. It's a really easy one to measure. We have a modified sphygmomanometer in our clinic and we just get the child to do three quick um, squeezes. And the reason I love grip strength so much is I don't view it as a um, measurement of strength, of grip. I view it as how clearly are the messages coming from the brain to the hand to actually create that movement of grip. So I view it as a selective motor control measure. And we find it incredibly responsive to constraint. So a minimally uh, important difference is around 5 millimeters mercury, and typically pre and post constraint we see changes of about 15 millimeters mercury. So it's a really nice way of tracking selective motor control in a really quick way that you can implement it to your practice. Um, children as young as three can get their hand around, how many of you guys have a modified sigma monometer in your practice? Just a few. There, it's something that you might want to consider. Um, you have to modify a blood pressure cuff, and it's basically you just squeezing the ball, and um, it's, it's a very quick measure to use. Um, looking at individual hand function, we use the Quest because you can get an individual score for how well the Hemi hand is working. And it takes about 20 minutes to administer. Um, it's a measure that's been developed um, out of um, McMaster. We also will use the assisting hand uh, assessment, and that gives us a measure of bilateral hand skills. How many of you are trained on the AHA? 
So um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a fiddly test, but it's probably the best one out there right now for uh, pediatrics testing bilateral hand skill. And there are some training um, videos and training workshops that, that can be organized. And then one of the important um, measures that we um, also include is this perspective of the parents giving us a rating of how much the child is using their hand in their day-to-day -day environment. And um, for the school-age child, we use the check. And um, I've given you the website here. It's um, free to use. And uh, um, the parents can go into the, the computer and they can answer questions. And the computer generates out a score, so it's, it's fairly user-friendly. Uh, uh, and it gets at that concept of when the child's not being watched, how frequently is he using the hand. The assisting hand assessment tool, um, this is just some information uh, on it. All right. So um, this is uh, one of the tasks in the AHA, uh -huh, and this is a child who's undergone uh, constraint. And all the tasks are bilateral hand tasks, so they're asked to pick up the symbols and clap them together. And this is the child's hemi hand on the other side right there. And you can see that this particular task is really hard to do. So it really taps into that bilateral hand skill. And then this is post-constraint, um, uh, post-constraint camp, the same uh, task. And you can see that he reaches for the, the symbol spontaneously and bangs it together. So it's just a standardized way of measuring uh, bilateral hand skills. <coughs> So, how to restrain the hand. Um, we have a range of uh, restraints that we offer, and we give the, the parent um, some of the deciding uh, capacity here. Um, I like the cast for um, older uh, children. I tend not to use the cast for younger children. Um, so, here's a picture of the cast. and. Um, one of the things that you need to do is you really need to trap the dominant hand. Um, they get really innovative. They poke things into the cast to uh, be able to use it. So you really need to cover the fingers and the thumb. We leave the elbow free. Um, this is a, a picture of the glove that um, we've developed in conjunction with our orthodist. It just has a little uh, piece here that can stabilize two wraps because the children get really good at sliding the, the glove off with their, with their body. And then um, in a camp setting, um, we often will bivalve a cast and, um, and then just uh, uh, cover it. And then here's another sort of removable cast uh, in an outpatient area. This is one of our older ones. We would trap the fingers more. These fingers are too open in this particular one. All right, so moving to what we're doing at a preschool level. Um, so guided by evidence, and, and here Dr. Gordon has uh, referred to the really nice work that uh, Anka Eliasson has done uh, from uh, Stockholm, uh, Sweden, um, where they have shown that wearing a removable, removable glove for two hours a day um, paired with practice intervention over eight weeks uh, showed an improvement. And so um, what we have done is we have really used um, what Dr. Gordon also referred to in, in his talk, a parent-mediated model. If the child's in a nursery school environment or daycare environment, we often will also meet with the daycare or nursery school um, helper and give them specific tasks to do. So we have the child wear this um, glove. Let's see, see a little close up here. And then uh, we do um, individual work with the child. And we give the um, uh, parent this handbook. And it's guided by an occupational therapist. So the occupational therapist specifically designates activities for the parent to work on that are upgraded each week during the program. 
Um, I'm sure many of you would like to have a copy of these uh, handbooks, and we're really happy to share them with you. Um, I um, didn't distribute them electronically because I really wanted to acknowledge the occupational therapists who did the hard work. So Linda Fay and Sophie uh, Lamdanji are the two occupational therapists who really were in the leadership positions to develop these. And I've warned them that you guys are going to be emailing them requesting these handbooks. So here's their, their emails, and uh, um, you can email either, either one, and they'll be happy to share both the preschool one as well as the school-aged one. And uh, this is just a copy of our, our school-aged uh, handbook. So uh, constraint therapy for the school-aged child. Um, again, at Blurview, I mentioned that we, we started to transition to doing this in the summer month. And Initially in the literature, we had a lot of casting only with very little individual structured work. And then we had a lot of constraint evidence, and then more recently we had the habit evidence. So again, at a practical level, we thought, let's combine all three of these aspects. And we've done it in a bit of a sequential way. So in the first week, we have the child wear the cast full time but they're not in the camp environment. So they're given some goals to work on, and they're introduced to that 24-hour-a-day wearing of the cast. And then the second week and the third week are the camp um, uh, environment. And in the second week at the camp, the focus is on unilateral uh, activities, so more additional constraint type program and they wear the cast during the um, during the week of the camp but at this point it's by belt and at a practical level that's important because um, uh, particularly for the child going to and uh, from the washroom often when they're wearing the cast they require assistance for that which in the home environment works fine but in a camp environment uh, can be a little bit problematic. And so having a bivalve valve cast allows them, if they need to, to remove it during washroom time. But otherwise, they keep the bivalve valve cast on. And then in the third week, um, the uh, cast is on for much less. And that's when they're doing a lot of bilateral ooh, hand activity practice. Um, the tasks at camp are graded and progressive. We don't have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, ratio. We're closer to a one-on-two. Uh, we do rely uh, on our occupational therapists, occupational therapy assistants, volunteers, as well as some occupational therapy uh, students to man the camp. And uh, um, they've been uh, quite successful. So these are just some um, activities that are included in the handouts. Um, we have a lot of one-handed uh, reaching skills. We have a lot of one-hand grasp, release, and motor control um, um, activities. And then a uh, section for uh, two-handed by manual activities. So um, just uh, finishing with a, a quote from uh, a client. Uh, um, so it was called Helping Hand Camp, but it was more like boot camp. <laughs> Snack time was really challenging because most of the food ended up on the floor rather than in my mouth. Um, when I got home, uh, I was really tired and went right to bed. So I think we have to remember that this is really hard work for the children to use their hands. And uh, taught me lots of lessons, and I believe that hard work can uh, lead to some gains. So I think I've ended on time. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is just a picture of our, uh, our new rehab center. <laughs> okay, so we'll take a few questions uh, from the webinar. Doug? Or... From the audience first? Okay, good. Okay, so do you have any questions for that specific one? Yeah. Okay, so the question is for eligibility criteria for kids to participate if they need to have a certain level of wrist extension, or what's the eligibility for that? Um, initially, we wanted the children to have some hand control and some ability to activate wrist extension. 
Um, we also excluded children who were predominantly dystonic because we worried that forcing um, constrained in movement of a dystonic hand might worsen. And um, finally, we um, worried about putting a child in a cast or restraint if there were significant balance problems for safety. So when they fell, we worried if we trapped their good hand that they wouldn't be able to protect themselves. And um, now I'd say the only one that we really follow is the safety one. Um, that even children with really low function of their hand, we have been able to see some improvements. Um, you have to be careful though because you do create a lot of frustration um, for the child who has really poor selective motor control. So you have to make sure that they, like if they're coming into a camp-like setting, that they themselves as an individual are really motivated to come in and participate and that it's not their parent forcing them uh, to. But we still will bring um, a child who has very little active wrist extension, finger extension, and see some improvements with constraint. Any other questions? Yes? So the question um, is regarding uh, the use of uh, the if the groups it should be a group or individual approach for both bilingual and uh, constraint, right? And the second part, when uh, about intensity, when you go to other settings such as school or daycare. So um, again, there's no right or wrong answers. Um, where we've landed for the preschool group is individual rather than a group setting, but. You could still try to run a group, and I'm not saying that would be wrong. We just found it more practical to do it um, at an individual level. And what we're trying to aim for is some individual work between a caregiver and the child that um, works up to two hours a day where they're also wearing the um, restraint. We have an occupational therapist who um, meets with the child and the family on a weekly basis. And so um, the activities and the homework are graded and they're progressive. And then if there is a willing, if the child is in a nursery school program or a daycare program, and if there is a willing partner in the daycare or the nursery school, and often it's not the nursery school teacher, it's often um, a nursery school aide or a, a volunteer in the setting, and they're willing to also do some individual activity, then that uh, information is passed on to the worker, often with um, a visit by the occupational therapist into the nursery school or the daycare environment to go over the, um, the route. We don't necessitate that it's two hours in a row, so often, you know, at a practical level, it's done in sort of four 30-minute pieces um, for the child's attention as well as the mom is often having to juggle, you know, day-to-day -day activities. And the, the glove, you saw the glove, um, we typically wear that for um, um, forcing the, the unilateral, but if we're working on a bilateral hand skill, then we can remove the glove, it's removable, and then you have the um, caregiver there to try to ensure activation of the, the non-dominant hand. Did I answer your question? <laughs>